What's up, everybody? This is Fred Ricciani of TSC News. I have right here via Skype a very special guest. In case you haven't heard, he's not just a Kevin Marshall. He is the Kevin Marshall. Comedian. That's right. One of the funniest people on Twitter. Former WWE writer. Former Spike.com writer. You may have seen his columns on all of Spike TV's digital platforms. A former colleague of mine. A buddy of mine. Again, not Kevin Marshall. The Kevin Marshall. And Kevin, you won't be able to see it until afterwards, but I actually put the Kevin Marshall on your lower third. I was just so inspired by Nikki Bella the other night on Raw. Be, wanted to be <laughs> referred to as the Nikki Bella. That I said, you know what? we got to call this guy the Kevin Marshall. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. And uh, I, I realize it's probably a reference to Brian Kendrick, but there also is a distinct possibility that's a rib on me. Uh, <laughs> actually, no, I don't think it is. Um, but yeah, I, I heard about that. I haven't watched Raw since uh, much at all since uh, I left uh, or was, was kicked out of WWE uh, as part of the epic layoffs back in July. Uh, but yeah, I heard about that and uh, just went, oh, all right. <laughs> Now, for, for those that don't <laughs> just kind of what yeah. it was just kind of what every fan who's uh, watching Raw lately seems to be going is like watching everything and every big segment like, hmm, all right, well, that, that, whatever. That's right. Now, you were in WWE uh, for, for a brief period, but it was a, a pivotal period, still is a pivotal period in WWE. I guess before we get to the changes in the business and the, a lot of the comparisons to 2001, which was also an incredibly pivotal year in the business, I got to say, man, you being a lifelong wrestling fan. Getting into mm -hmm. WWE, mm -hmm. getting involved much deeper than you thought you would be. What was that whole right. experience like in the last year? Um, I mean, people are like, oh, wow, it's your dream job. It's not. Uh, and it wasn't. It never was. I didn't apply to be a writer for creative. Uh, the way that the posting read online uh, was that I was applying to be a um, What's called it was the title was uh, at first was digital writer, uh, and so I applied for it thinking like yeah I'd love to work on like the website end of things and social media and blah blah blah, uh, and you know they brought me in and they talked about how they wanted to do more storytelling and uh, using those platforms and I said you know that's great uh, because you know the one thing I noticed is that and, and this isn't a knock on the WWE.com guys because a lot of those guys are great. Um, but one, they're handcuffed by, you know, orders from above. And two, they have a tendency to get smart marky. And it's just like, if I want to read that shit, I can go anywhere else. You know, like what I wanted was more like after mag type stuff, you know, like that. Because that's what I loved. And I know it's a huge step backwards, some people would think. But I, the thing that I always loved about the after mags was like reading all these stories that I otherwise wouldn't read. And then by stories, I mean, like not like hard hitting journalism or like, you know, behind the scenes type stuff. But Actual extensions of storytelling, so like Ricky Morton and uh, what's his name from the Rock and Roll Express? Christ, uh, Gibson. help me. Gibson, Gibson. yeah, yeah, Gibson, uh, Robert Gibson. Uh, they would be having a feud, and then as an extension of that, they would have like this whole like fake back and forth uh, in PWI, and like they would do this whole like they used to have this regular column where guys that were feuding used to like have the opportunity to address each other and they would say like listen we had him in a phone conversation and you know bill after was talking to them blah 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 and to really enhance like every story that's kind of what i wanted to do so i you know i told them that when i went to interview for it uh, and they said yeah that's sort of exactly what we're looking for um and so i thought great you know so i, I honestly thought i would be writing articles for the website uh and then i got there and they brought me into the creative writers room uh, in Stanford, and you know I got to meet everybody. And I was sitting there, and uh, after a full day of being in there, I was like, "All right." And they had told me they were going to have me like uh, meet with some of the digital guys too, and uh, meet with them on a regular basis, and sort of be a liaison between digital and creative. So I thought, "Oh, cool." Um, so I assumed, as did everybody else that was in that room, uh, that I was going to have like a spot outside of the creative writing room where digital is placed and kind of sit there and, you know, have my own cubicle and just be brought in for them to like bounce ideas off me or for me to give ideas to them, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then my title got changed to writer comma digital slash social, uh, which then meant I was just in the a part of the creative team 24 seven. And they would just look at me and said, you know, I would just be talking about, general storylines and when they said oh can we do this uh on dot com 
yeah, sure, you know, or is this executable, or is this good, or that, yeah. Uh, and, but then on top of that, I'm just, I was just a general part of creative. Uh, so it was, it was weird. I never really understood, like, how it happened, if that was the intent from the beginning, or if they just decided, well, he seems to have, you know, some sort of knowledge of, you know, storytelling, and seems like he'd be a good fit in the room, so let's keep him in there. I don't know. Uh, but long story short, I applied for one job and then got the job pretty much as a writer and went, well, shit. <laughs> now I'm in for it. And I was. And how hands-on is Vince McMahon in the entire creative process? I mean, I know that he has the final say and everything, but in terms of the meetings, I mean, is he there all the time saying, damn it, let's figure out Raw and SmackDown? Or is he kind of like the guy that you see last after you guys kind of meet up and everything? Yeah, no, we meet all week and we meet, we would meet with Vince like very late on Thursday nights, uh, sometimes Wednesdays, but very rarely, um, sometimes twice a week, but that was like very, very rare. Um, he, Vince, uh, you know, a lot of his, his work comes on Mondays and Tuesdays, you know, when we're at the live tapings. And uh, unfortunately, you know, he, he not only has a final word, I mean, he micromanages everything to death. I mean, I, I had said in my first interview, I said, you know, I, I understand this company is Vince's brain living and breathing in the real world. Uh, and it very much is like, you know, the kind of worldview that all these characters have are pretty much Vince's worldview, you know, and that's how he thinks. And the way that women are treated and portrayed is how he thinks women act and should be portrayed. Uh, and a lot of the types of stories we tell, you know, a lot of the thing was just learning how to pitch to Vince because Vince can't wrap his head around, you know, more sophisticated storytelling. He he can't he he doesn't get contemporary attitudes. Let's put it that way. He's a guy who's been living in his own world and promoting his own stuff for decades, and he doesn't know any other way. He's lived a very insular lifestyle, um, and so you know, pretty much our job was to sit around and uh, try to figure out what Vince is thinking, and then tell him and have him tell us he's changed his mind. So <laughs> it's like every, everything, everything top to bottom. And I mean, you could see it with the network launch too. gets uh, micromanaged to death. Was it intimidating when you first met him? I mean, this is Vincent freaking McMahon. <laughs> nope. No, I, I, I didn't find it intimidating at all. You know, I shook his hand, you know, made eye contact and I sat in on a few meetings with him. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I think he wants to be intimidating. Surely. Uh, I think he thinks he is, uh, but no, I wasn't intimidated by him at all. I, but th that's the thing is I'm not intimidated by anybody because, you know, I'm on that level of the spectrum, I guess, where I just uh, don't have that capability. All right. Well, you've been successful before. Prior to that, you know, you were at, you were at Spike TV, did very well for yourself. So, hey, man, yeah. you, 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 had a ba you had a background. It's not like you're some green rookie coming in there and not know what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And listen, it's like, I, I think it helped that I didn't set out to do this. You know what I mean? I even applied for the digital job at WWE, what I thought it was as a lark. You know, I, I had uh, no preconceptions about it. I, I don't worship at anybody's feet. Uh, and I just didn't really. Uh, and that was the thing working at Spike is like, you know, I, I would work with celebrities and everything. And unfortunately, I, I work with some very nice people that it could, you know, just say you're too fanboy and fangirlish at times. And it was kind of embarrassing. Like, I, I've never been one, like, I'm, I'm, the, I'm not the type of guy who, I, like, I never get pictures. There's only one pe person I can recall in the last few years that I was, like, that I took a picture with. And it was actually uh, Abyss as Joseph Park. <laughs> uh, and literally, he insisted on it. Uh, and he, he was in character. And it was this really fun thing where we shot, uh, we shot a segment for uh, Spike.com, which I think you can still find on there, when TNA was doing their tour tours of uh, ballparks. And we went to that minor league ballpark uh, that's in on Coney Island, and uh, he was there. And he was in the Joseph Park uh, gimmick, and he was in full character the entire time, <laughs> and he was fantastic. And uh, he flipped out when uh, me and my good friend Brian Dermody, who was also there, um, who we both know and worked with, uh, and and he heard like you know he he knew who Brian was. But he acted like he was just seeing us and hearing of us for the first time, and he found out we were with Spike TV, and he acted like he didn't know what capacity we were with, so he, like, freaked out, and he was like, oh, man, a guy's from Spike TV, and he got all excited, he was like, here, I gotta take pictures with you, and it was really funny, and I, you know, I put the, the picture up on my Facebook, but... I'm very much, like, not a person who ever takes pictures with celebrities, and in fact, I, I very much 
frowned on it and got embarrassed a few times when like I would produce a segment uh, for online or for TV and somebody I was working with, like a celebrity guest we were interviewing, like would ask to get a picture taken. It was like I just I just think I was just like I, I would cringe at it. Um, on a professional level, uh, I, I don't fault people for doing that on like, you know, a day to day, you know, if you run into somebody, it's just not something I ever did because then maybe it was the way I was raised or whatever. I'm just not impressed by a person's presence and existence. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got that. You got that Daniel Bryan attitude. Daniel Bryan talked about it on the WWE yeah. Network special for WrestleMania. Same thing. He doesn't understand the concept of celebrity. He's shocked whenever he sees somebody freaking out over him. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that and that's the thing is like, you know, it's one of those things where you have enough self awareness. And I think Daniel Bryan is the same way. I don't know him, uh, but this is the impression I get. It's like he has enough self awareness, uh, like I do, or I ho I try to have, and I make the effort to to kind of like step away and step aside from all that and kind of look at like the celebrity worship culture that we have um even though we're not alone uh, other countries have it too but american society especially and i kind of look at it and it's just like it is kind of if you're to step aside and look at it objectively it's really freaking weird like it's weird that people sit around and will talk at a restaurant about whether or not that's a famous person sitting at another table and like stare at them the entire time it's like, if it is or it isn't, like, who cares? I, I'm hungry. I want my food. Yeah, I mean, poor Randy Orton. I don't know if you saw the picture floating around <laughs> online. There's a picture of him washing his hands. A picture in the mirror of Randy Orton washing his hands. I mean, like, oh, man. Poor guy. Yeah. I, and, and Randy, you know, I, and I don't know Randy personally, but I, I, I love him as a worker. And, and it's just yeah. funny because sometimes you'll see him, like, snap at fans, like, in the middle of a match. Like, I remember <laughs> yeah. he was, like, ringing the bell. And he goes, there is no bell. It's no disqualification. And I can only just imagine, like, his reaction, seeing this kid <laughs> taking, taking a picture in the bathroom. Like, come on, man. Like, just. Oh, uh, yeah. He, man. he was, I mean, he was, I, I, I uh, had a couple run-ins run with him, I should say. Uh, not to say that, like, run-ins, like, bad. Just, yeah. like. Very, very, you know, brushed by him because, like, you know, again, I was on the home team when I did serve on the road. I didn't produce a lot of segments. Um, but the few interactions I did have with him were always fucking great because he's like that 24 7. He's like, he, he's a, <laughs> he's like a human sad sack. He's like, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Uh, uh. It's like, uh, he, he came one day and he was like, oh, is the verbiage uh, finalized? And I was like, uh, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. I'll send it out an email. It's like, oh, great. You know, we got an hour to go. Verb just finalized. <laughs> Fucking horrific. And he would start out, and like exactly how you would imagine he is, it's, oh is how he is. Did, 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 did you see Raw a couple weeks ago when he attacked Chris Jericho? I did not, because again, I haven't watched, uh, or did I, I might have mentioned that off the air. I really, since I got laid off, I haven't watched Raw in a while, because one of the great things, like the big size of relief I had, uh, was that I didn't have to sit through over three hours of Raw every week. <laughs> Like, after you do that for, um, I think I was there for, like, 10 months, uh, just doing the math real quickly, uh, and doing it 24-7, the last thing you want to do after you leave is is sit through a lot of professional wrestling, um, particularly WWE and especially, like, a three-plus-hour show. It's just, I, I can't, I, I even try, and it's just like, I just can't do it. Yeah, man, it, I, I mean, I mean, with all due respect, man, you're, to your ex-colleagues and everything, it's been, a, it's been a chore to watch these last, like, four to six weeks. It really has. And they had a couple weeks ago, they had the season premiere of Raw. I don't know, there was yeah. a season premiere. And Randy, <laughs> and I don't know who feeds Randy Orton these lines, man, but, like, yeah. he beat the hell out of Chris Jericho, injured his knee, and then mm. he go, what did he say? He said, sorry, Chris, what can I say? It's the season premiere. And he said it exactly <laughs> in a way that you would imagine. To me, that's a great line. It is I a great line, but it's, it's like, it's Randy. It, it was just, it's not supposed to be funny, though. It's supposed to be, like, intense, but it's Randy Orton. <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like, I mean, maybe this is just, just Randy, but. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Randy said that and it was, like, his own personal in-joke to amuse himself. Because that's hilarious. It was, it was hilarious. Because so, so that's a sort of, like, sarcastic, like. Uh, great sense of humor that he has. Like, what can I say? It's a season premiere. Um, a lot of, and here's my full on, full bore defense of uh, creative and the guys that are there right now. Um, uh, they they have a they have the job of Sisyphus. They're they're pushing that boulder uphill, and there's a lot of them trying to do it, and uh, it's still a chore because they have Vince pushing back. Uh, it, when something does work. And when something uh, does seem like it's written well, 
um, it, it, it's only because of their efforts and they're trying to like politically maneuver the right thing to happen. Uh, a lot of that verbiage, like, because Vince approves verbiage pretty much line by line, and a lot of that stuff when it like sounds stilted is because of Vince, and you learn to write how Vince wants you to write, which is wholly inorganic. Uh, you know, you you can't write it like a uh, show dialogue. One because you know, if you're writing a TV show like a, a one hour drama. Pro wrestlers talking to each other like that and interacting like to each other like that would sound ridiculous. In fairness, um, you also can't write it how you think like pro wrestling would sound and like you know the thing. Oh, he should say this because it would be cool and this is what they would how they would do it ten years ago because then you'll get the feedback and then know oh that's too wrestling. Uh, so it was, it's this style of writing that's like nowhere else because you know top to bottom that company is Vinceified and it's his personality. So if, if Randy went up to you, Kevin, you know, as mm-hmm. you were working there, and, and was mm-hmm. like, what can I say? I want more input. And he gives you some <laughs> ideas. Can you just, like, factor it into your writing or your colleague's writing? Or do you have to go through Vince first and say, hey, Randy has this idea? Or would Randy or a guy like that just go to Vince directly? Well, the, the guys on the road are the ones that would get approached with that. Uh, and, yeah, they would usually – they could bring it to Vince. Or guys like Randy who have been there forever or, you know, especially John Cena – uh, a lot of those guys can bring their ideas to Vince directly. Uh, that is the one great thing about Vince is he'll sit there and he will listen to pitches. I mean, tons of guys brought him pitches. Uh, you know, Big E would bring him pitches. Uh, but, yeah, that like part of it, sometimes it would be the talent. Sometimes it would be the talent would use the writers to like kind of bounce it off them and say, you know, one, do you think this works? And two, do you think Vince thinks this will work? Because that's a lot of the process is just figuring, trying to figure out again what's in Vince's head and be like, you know, will this, and our, our Vince, you know, we would, a lot of our vetting would be, unfortunately, you know, this is a great idea. How can we make this work for Vince? And how can we get it through him? And to an extent, that's every show that you're going to write for. You know, you're at the whims of the showrunner. It's just like in this particular instance, it's a uh, CEO wrestling promoter. So it becomes completely insane. <laughs> And how involved was Paul Levesque in the creative meetings? Or was he is he more kind of like hands-on with NXT and that creative side of things? Uh, he's very hands-on with NXT. I mean, that's his baby. But yeah, he's part of creative too. And like, you know, we would, uh, he, he would be part of the process as well. Um, because, I mean, he is obviously being groomed to, for him and Stephanie eventually to take over. And, you know, with how they uh, restructured it lately, I think it's pretty obvious Uh is that, you know, a lot of the TV and creative direction and stuff, when, when Vince leaves, which will be never, uh, you know, Paul would take over the, or uh, Hunter would take over the, you know, creative aspect of it, pretty much. And then uh, and then Stephanie would be the corporate face, which she already is, and she does a fantastic job at it. I mean, she kills at that job, and she's, you know, in terms of, like, it's sort of like back in the day when, like, Linda was, like, the chairman of the board, or the CEO, basically, and then, like, Vince would be the chairman, and Linda would be the corporate face of it. Uh, Stephanie has a, will, will have that same role, I imagine. Um, and so, so you know, Hunter's very involved in the day, in the, the creative and stuff, um, you know, but we're still, at the end of the day, everybody's at the uh, whims of Vince. Makes sense. Now, 2014. This year's not even over yet, man. But it's already been a, a pivotal year for just in WWE alone. Okay, mm-hmm. Let, let's run down what, what's gone down in, in 2014. WWE changes right. its its entire business model. Pay per view, the pay per view business. Yeah. I, I guess you could practically call it dead at this point. Undertaker streak is broken. Almost. Under yeah, yeah. Uh, Undertaker streak is broken. Uh, mm-hmm. John Cena, I mean, he's te- he's still going strong, but obviously they're grooming Roman Reigns or a Dean Ambrose to take that top spot. Uh, right. I, I mean, a shield, the shield breaks up. They probably could have gone on a little bit longer. You look at, you know, outside of WWE, TNA, mm-hmm. you know, just running on fumes right now. Maybe they'll land a new TV deal. Who's to say the TV deal will even keep them in business? I mean, this is probably the craziest year in wrestling. <laughs> you know, I'm, it, I'm just going to just gonna interrupt you. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Uh, the, the the stuff that I've heard about the TV deals that they could have lined up will will be the death of them either way. I I would I would be shocked if TNA continued past the end of the year. And in fact, I think we've already seen, or or some of us have already seen the last of TNA. I think that last round of tapings is it. Uh, I think Bound for Glory is going to be the final show, and uh, I think that's and I know of course that's all me speculating based on what I've read, uh, but. 
yeah, it's TNA is pretty much done, and Ring of Honor is the de facto number two company in the United States now, which is sorry, guys. You know, if you're fans of Ring of Honor, that's a that's a little bit scary and kind of shitty. Yeah, I mean, with TNA, I think they have to. There's they have to book quote unquote have to book uh, one more set of tapings to wrap up the year because Spike TV did extend them for uh, the rest of the year. But yeah, like you said, I mean, even if they get those TV deals, they're the death of they could be the death of them or will be the death of them because you know who's gonna pay Spike money? You know what I mean? Nobody Velocity ain't gonna pay them. Like oh, Spike well, they're, does. no, 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 no. They're they're not gonna get Spike money again. And they had a sweetheart deal, and they did. You know, I I saw some of it firsthand when we, you know, we were both at Spike, uh, and and read a lot about it too. Uh, they had a sweetheart deal, and uh, they did everything they could to ruin it. Yeah, it's, it's like active incompetence, like really aggressive. Yeah, well, it's yeah, well, really, it, yeah. it's and it's sad too because again, like they had guys and. And, and it's funny because you because you and I were there around the time when there was still some optimism with the TNA product. And, and granted, you know they kind of screwed things up with with James Storm, and he was never the same after he beat him in his hometown, which I still find ridiculous. I mean, he's never been the same since they didn't give him the so title. Stupid. It, it, yeah, it, so stupid. It's very stupid. But prior to Aces and Eights coming in, I mean, you remember that period in like 2012, yeah. 2013? Like it was good. Like the first six yes. months of of 2013, it wasn't like a show that necessarily had. Too many things of consequence occur, but it was an easy show to watch. It was an easy yes. two hours to watch. Even yes. Hulk Hogan was tolerable. He was a good GM. He, he worked yeah. for that role, and you just saw good wrestling every week. And you could build on that. You know, it's better than than being having to build from a you know a bad show with a lot of bad booking and and logical finishes. Like every week to week, it was a good show. And then Jesus Christmas, it just f- fell off a cliff. I, I guess. Once the Aces and Ace thing got in full swing, or maybe yeah, like Boy I, Ray thing, I, 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 I think know. that's when it happened. And like, you know, once the Aces and Ace became like a central angle, I think because somebody got in their head that Sons of Anarchy is a huge show, and that's Spike's demo, and so this would be really cool and a really great thing to do. I, I think it had some legs to it, but as like a company wide angle, I think it was just. Because a, a bunch of out of shape wrestlers uh, pretending to be biker guys is just like lame. You know what I mean? Like, it's a cool gimmick. Like, Disciples of Apocalypse could have worked if those guys, you know, had been handled correctly, or maybe if different guys had been in that role. You know, like the biker gimmick can work. It can be cool. Um, but when you lean too heavily on it and you make a company wide angle, it's just like they're not the NWO. It just it just yeah. makes it look like. And also, too, I think pro wrestling as a whole had just been exhausted from invasion angles um tna had done its fair share and it's just like you know doing another invasion angle with uh, a group of guys can that can you know uh very diplomatically even with bully ray there be seen as b and c level and they dragged it out for so long too. and dragged out for oh so long god like but it, yeah i used you know i used to say that all the time when i was guest on like uh my friend tom green's uh wrestle folks podcast uh when i was with spike you know, I would preface it by saying, yeah, I work for Spike TV, but I still believe it now. It's like that period of TNA was like at that time was the most watchable wrestling program out there. It's like it's not, you know, it was, it was two hours. It would be a little too long at times to be two hours. You know, I think the prime prime length for a wrestling show is probably like 60 or 90 minutes. Um, but still, like it didn't it didn't go out of its way. It was this period of time in TNA where it didn't like actively try to insult your intelligence and it didn't make like really really bad booking mistakes um unfortunately then yeah when it came time to uh for the uh chickens to come home to roost uh you know they did stuff like the aces and eights angle and then james storm losing in his hometown and then when like when it came time to do the payoffs that's when they started screwing it up and, and, then- and dixie i think i think it really fell off the cliff once dixie became a, an on-air heel authority figure that was to yeah was those- it just you felt like the show went from like, all right, you know, it's watchable to like, oh my god, what what is going on here? And it was around the yeah. time when Stephanie McMahon was doing it a hell of a lot better. And, and and that's the thing, and that's exactly why they did it because Stephanie McMahon, who uh, and I say this with all sincerity, Stephanie is like my favorite performer in WWE in terms of like her character, how she carries herself, and her uh, presence and her mic work. She's amazing. Um, as much as like people used to joke about how like you know uh, really bad she was back in the day, um, I mean she's she she's an amazing performer and she's awesome in that role that she has. 
Uh, and I think that uh, TNA saw that and, you know, as they always have throughout their history, uh, tried to do what turned out to be a poor man's version of it. Um, inevitably, even if you, even if, let's just say hypothetically, uh, Dixie had been given that role and wasn't awful at it, say she knocked it out of the park, she's still going to look like the poor man Stephanie McMahon because she's on the B-level show. And unless you, like, embrace what you are and try to be an alternative, if you try to just copy WWE angles because you think it works, all you're going to do is look second run and second rate. But that's compounded by, you know, it makes it worse when you have someone like Dixie who just shouldn't be in that role on TV because that's just not where her strengths are. And, you know, I'm not there, so I can't speak to what they are, but they are not as being, like, an on-air heel GM or authority figure. It just... Oh, what a disaster! <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I guess, and I guess to uh, back to our, uh, I mean, our original point. I mean, yeah, TNA. I won't be surprised if they're done by the end of the year. It's it's freaking sad, but it is what it is. On top of mm-hmm. all the things that have occurred with WWE, most importantly, the shift to the network and pay per view business mm-hmm. being practically on its deathbed. Yeah. What comparisons can you make? To the, from this year to 2001, which saw the fall of WCW and ECW and how the business just almost, I don't want to say overnight, but in a short amount of time just changed and not necessarily for the better. Yeah, um, well, well, the one uh, thing in common in 2001 and 2014 is that you had a secondary company, even though TNA never reached the heights WCW did, um, it also um, did things uh, to proactively um, induce their own demise. And I, I think that's that's the whole thing with like the revisionist history and the Monday Night Wars. Um, they, they talk about how WCW was always awful from the beginning, and that's not true. I mean, you'll hear Meltzer talk about that, and even like we, to say just as fans, we were there and we saw it. Like WCW did a lot of things right, and they killed a lot of stuff, and they knocked that out of the park. Um, but then you know they started actively making bad decisions and compounding it with more big bad decisions and. You know, obviously there were other factors, but towards the end, it was just like aggressively bad television that did them in. Um, in terms of what WWE is doing, uh, WWE, I think, I think fudged the uh, WCW invasion angle to an extent. Uh, I, I do think that people overstate uh, WWE's handling of it to uh, a little bit. You know, obviously the WCW guys were made to look lesser, um, but. I think they were going to be handicapped from the beginning anyway, and this might sound defeatist, but I mean, what did they have to work with? Obviously, they didn't have the big stars. Like, they didn't have Goldberg at that time and Steiner when they started an angle. Um, but that's the problem when, like, you're two, when the only two guys that can make this work are, are Goldberg, Steiner, and maybe, like, like, I don't think, you know, Nash being in there would have made that work. Uh, because, you know, he was on his last legs literally as a performer <laughs> by that point. You know, uh, Scott Hall was not going to be in any state to make that work. Uh, Hulk Hogan in 2001 was not uh, in in a heel role as part of WCW was not going to make that work. I don't know if Sting was going to make that work. That brand was just, I mean, that brand was literally dead when they started that angle. And, and, you know, that's a very, very hard place to start an invasion angle. Um, The call to make like Shane and Stephanie McMahon from a storyline standpoint, it made sense. Um, also from like a draw and interest standpoint, it was really the only thing they could have done to have any interest. Now you can argue execution and everything after that. Um, but you know, WCW just didn't have any value at that point. Uh, with the network, I think this is more on, you know, I, I think WWE as a company as a whole, uh, botched the execution a little bit. Um, I, I, I think a lot of that was the result of, uh, people spearheading it and making the decisions for it, who just like didn't really, didn't really know what an over the top network was, other than saying the phrase over the top. Uh, I, I think the perfect example of you know just the the tone deaf nature of this whole thing is the phrase you know WWE Network. It's way over the top. Uh, if you ask the average fan what that means, they kind of like, oh, it's it's a pun. You know what I mean? Like they they don't know that because it's an insider jargony phrase. And them trying to use that as a marketing phrase just goes to show if, like, they hear that, it's like, oh, it's way over the top. And then they go and run with it, even though it doesn't mean anything to anyone. So from a marketing standpoint, they're already screwed. Um, from an execution standpoint, 
uh, you know, the two things that two big things that that really hurt it. Um, one is the pay per view thing. Uh, and, and, you know, this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but you know, there were some of us who like when this net when they said this network was being launched, said, "Wow, I, I can't believe we're going to be putting Rumble and WrestleMania on there." You know, uh, those are that that's a lot of revenue for us to take a hit, and we're going to need a lot of subscribers to make up for the money. Um, it might have been, I don't know if it would have been too soon to launch the network. It might have been too soon, maybe, to put all of the pay per view on there because you were, regardless, when you, it's a move, it, you know, WWE was in a tricky position. They were in a position where they did have to make this move. I mean, sooner or later, you know, the, the pay per view revenue, uh, it, it is going to go down over time. And, you know, it's being usurped by, you know, stuff like Netflix. Um, so WWE was right in predicting that this is going to be the model that will sustain a company that large uh, for years to come. It might have been a little too soon, uh, obviously, because, you know, the pay-per-view companies, you know, were really pissed at them. And there's no going back now. Uh, you know, Dish and DirecTV obviously dropped them. Um, and and I, th- I think, too, like, just from a user standpoint, uh, you know, the biggest problem I had with it from the beginning was the user interface. You know, there was no queue you could build. Um, you got brought immediately to that 24-7 online stream that they have, which is so stupid and unnecessary. Uh, and I think that's another mistake they made, too, is wasting all this money and time and resources and doing, like, 24-hour programming. And they're emphasizing the stream way too much, like, via the text alerts, rather than saying you could watch it on demand, which should be the yeah. main draw. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's how people use Netflix. That's even how, like, you know, as much as I knock the UFC and a lot of the decisions they make... Like, Fight Pass works because when they go live, they have the li- link to click to watch something live. Uh, and I did sign up for Fight Pass recently, and I got to say I'm happy with it on the whole uh, for that reason. And it's like they don't need to be running something 24-7. And that's why Fight Pass, from the beginning, made money. One, because they already had the interface to build on because they just used the pre-existing UFC.TV interface. Uh, Fight Pass, to an extent, pretty much already existed. And they just built on it to make like a streaming service that was a little bit more accessible, a little bit more user friendly. Uh, and the other thing is that they didn't waste time and resources doing a freaking 24 seven stream. Like, why do I need to watch the Monday Night Wars immediately after Raw ends? No, just like make it available on demand. It's just like, wh- why? Why does there need to be 24 seven streaming when you have this stuff that you can watch at any time? Uh, the other thing is, too, uh, I, I as much as they made available at the outset, it seemed like a good deal. Um, I still don't think it was enough because when you want to grab people from that nostalgia factor, the stuff that people remember from, you know, their days of watching and enjoying and loving wrestling really isn't the pay-per-views. It's the television. And they didn't make any of that old WCW or that old WWF television available. Like it took them however many months to make the Clash of the Champions available. It's like to me, that's. That sort of stuff and like WCW Saturday Night and all that classic stuff is day one. One, because that's the stuff people saw that they want to watch again. And those are where the big angles occurred. And two, because without those, the pay-per-views, especially the older WCW ones and the older WWF ones, a lot of those don't have any context without the television. So you have like all of this this great opportunity and you just like, you know, kind of short shrift the consumer because you think, oh, well, we'll do a slow rollout so that, you know, it gives people more incentive to renew. But if they're not happy with the service out the get go and they're not getting what they feel they're paying for, then they're not going to like look at you giving them a little bit of scrap of something else. They're going to go you know, and say, ooh, you know, that's really exciting. You're going to give me all the clash of the champions. I'm going to say, yeah, I can probably find this all online anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, for me, I'm a huge, I'm a huge WCW fan. And mm-hmm. seeing all the Nitros watching them, I mean, a lot, a lot of them still hold up pretty well, actually, as far as, you know, production value wise. And I'm just amazed. Like, we finally got Nitro, and it's only up to 96. <laughs> yeah, which, again, then that's a weird thing, too. Uh, I think if you make Nitros available, make them available. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I'm not going to watch them episodically like once a week. Uh, that's not how, like, that's, like, if I watch like a uh, House of Cards, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, I'll watch the next episode next week. Or like, you know, if, if, if let's say Netflix decided we're going to release the next season of House of Cards, but we're only going to release one episode a week, it would be a disaster. 
because that's not how people consume stuff online. They, they binge, binge watch, watch. It. exactly, exactly, exactly. So it, it, it's just a, a real. It just shows a real like lack of understanding of um, contemporary culture and uh, how it's executed. Dude, I'm on UFC Fight Pass right now. I actually recently signed up too. I signed up right before yeah. the Conor McGregor fight, which was a, yeah. a very good decision on my part. All right, I'm just going to read you some of these collections that UFC has. And keep yeah. in mind, UFC is actively seeking more video libraries. Well, they, they don't even have to. They already got a ton of stuff. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking right now on Fight Pass. Here's what they have. Every single UFC ever, including all the random fuel shows, Affliction, right. Elite XC, Invicta, including new events, all of the Prides. I'm a huge Pride mark. Strike yeah. Force. <laughs> like that's that's the best part yeah. of that. Strike Force, WEC, World Fighting Alliance, and there's rumors that they may acquire Hook and Shoot, which is where the Nogueira brothers, Misha Tate, and a ton of yeah, a ton of people yeah. got their start. Uh, there's rumors that they may even acquire all of the FEG library, which is like K1 and Dream. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, if you're also, a, I mean, if you're also an, M an MMA fan, you mean, I mean, what's the point of watching DDB Network when you can just watch UFC Fight Pass? I mean, yeah, you got everything. Yeah. Also, too, like uh, Japan, especially the old Japan stuff, like the uh, uh, especially Pride had much better booking and storytelling, I think, than a lot of uh, contemporary pro wrestling. And I don't just say WWE; I just think on a whole. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That, that was the promotion that, like, you know, they got done in by a uh, Yakuza scandal, or Yakuza, however you say it. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 story that broke really, really killed them. Um, and you know, if they they could have gone. Uh, going on a lot longer uh because they during that like peak period that they did they just did everything right from the storytelling to the presentation to the booking everything was done perfectly that uh as much as people talk about how mma is kind of like pro wrestling but real that era of pride if you've never seen it you should you should check it out and especially check out fight pass because that is like the perfect example of like if pro wrestling was real that's exactly how like ideally it would look and be executed Oh my god! And, and you talk about a guy like like Vanderlei Silva, who one of the yeah. top stars of Pride. I mean, I I don't know. He might be the greatest pro wrestling character in MMA history. So I think the axe yeah. murderer in in his prime. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. maybe him or him and Sakuraba. You know, you go you yes. pull the coin between yeah. between those two. Yeah. <sighs> Man, for yeah, Sakuraba, Sakuraba and his feud with the Gracies was like the greatest, like, oh my god, pro wrestling storyline you ever saw in MMA. The Gracie, <laughs> like the gra yeah, forget the legend killer. We had the Gracie killer, yeah, the Gracie killer, and that was a huge, and especially like in the context of like Japan and the history of like uh, Valley Tudo there, like that was just such a great story, you know. And, and it's a shame because for those that don't know, Vanderlei Silva announced his retirement. Long story short, I guess we'll recap what happened. He was supposed to fight Chael Sonnen. Uh, fight got you know rescheduled. They did the Brazilian Ultimate Fighter. Chael ended up becoming the baby face on that show in Brazil. Which the, was, yeah, in in Brazil, like that was a talking point that uh, Brian uh, Alvarez and Dave Meltzer talked about too. Of like, it's pretty amazing when Chael Sonnen can become the baby face in Brazil. Yeah, Vondi's lost his mind, man. And and, and then guy. he and then he he fa well no, what happens is Chael failed the drug test. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Chael failed the drug test. Or what happened was they were both tested. Or no, they were mm. both going to be tested. Vanderlei just bounced. Okay, he ran. He literally ran away. He ran away. You know, straight up Diaz brother style, <laughs> running away from <laughs> yeah, immediate he... in, immediate engagement. <laughs> uh, yo, Chael he snuck out. He literally snuck <laughs> out the back door. <laughs> he did. Probably Caesar Gracie was waiting for him. And... He's like snagglepuss, <laughs> like oh, exit stage left. Chael like took, actually, yeah. I heard. I, I don't know this, and I can't verify this, but I heard from people that were there that when Vanderlei found out that they were there to test him for drugs. He jumped up in the air and spun his feet in the air very quickly like a cartoon character and then took off. And all that was left was like a cartoon cloud silhouette of Vanderlei. <laughs> That's awesome. And well, we all know Chael failed and uh, I think he's banned for two years and yeah. he's pretty much retired, which is pretty pretty sad because he's a very charming fellow. But, you know, hey, it, it is what it is. He, he, got he, he was a great character and he was like an awesome draw for the UFC. And it's just like he's one of those that... I, I just think, unfortunately, he's got a he's got a very self destructive personality, and he just does himself in on this shit. Yeah. Like he, and, and it's not necessary. Like, here's the thing, with Chael, you don't Chael doesn't need to win fights. Like that's what really gets me. It's like he he does this to be uber competitive, but it's like he doesn't. He's such a good talker and he's such a good character. He doesn't need to win championships. He doesn't even need to fight at that level. He could have been a middling fighter, clean. And still been at the top and still drawn a lot of money. It's just so unbelievably stupid. 
Yeah, I mean, we don't know. I mean, medically, maybe he just her. You know what? Maybe it's a mental thing too. Maybe he just felt like he really, you know, had to had to rely on that stuff. I mean, the fact that he got caught I with HGH and EPO. I mean, man, and then yeah, and, and then, I mean, there's there's no like the, the only reason it's sort of a, a damned if you do, damned if you don't type thing. The only reason where it would be medically necessary is if he had been, he had abused those substances for so long that he could no longer medically produce testosterone. Which I, I guess is possible, but isn't very likely. I, I think more of it is just that he's always had that, you know, that competitive spirit in him, which does a lot of guys like him in, which is that he'll do anything and everything to try to get that extra edge to be the best Chael Sonnen that he can be inside of the cage. Um, and it's it's just that, and it's a uh, I think it's a it's the moral degradation of his character too. I mean, he he did that even when he was. You know, getting involved in real estate, he tried to skirt the rules. You know what I mean? A lot of people rib him for that, but it's like, you know, there are a lot of things he can't do because he's been convicted of that. And it's like, it's one of those things that, like, you look on the surface and you're like, man, that is so stupid. Like, why did he do that? He, like, really screwed himself in that, you know, that real estate deal. Um, and it was wholly unnecessary. But it's just like, guys like that, they, it's not that they think the rules don't pertain to them. It's that they think they can, one, find a way to skirt the rules, and two, that, you know, they need to do it in order to be the best that they can be. Right. And Vanderlei ran away from the drug test. He then uh, <laughs> just over the weekend, I think over the weekend. We have to we have to emphasize. I'm sorry. Every time we say that, we have to emphasize literally ran away. Literally ran away from a drug test. A couple <laughs> days ago, he announced yeah. his retirement in a bizarre video where he buried the UFC six feet under. And then yeah. today, his lawyer, uh, which is hilarious. The yeah. NAC Nevada Athletic Commission hearing was broadcast live on Fight Pass. You catch Which that? Which I did weekend. watch. Yeah I, yeah, I caught that. Yeah, and and he is banned for life from MMA and fined seventy thousand dollars. Yeah. Even though he's technically not a licensed fighter, now he yeah. plans on fighting this. Even though he intends on staying retired. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to necessarily debate the legal ramifications of this, but just what are your overall thoughts on Vanderlei? I guess crapping on his legacy, really. I mean, the guy turned heel in Brazil. I, yeah. He, you know, he could have retired after that incredible Brian Stan fight and, and say, Tama, Japan. He does this thing with cool. Chael. There's so much hype with Sun, and, and then it doesn't happen. It's just, it's just a sad end to a great career. It is, and it, it's tragic. You know what I mean? He's one of those guys that unfortunately just, I mean, as much as I loved him, and he was one of my favorite fighters, and I loved watching him, he hung on for way too long, and I, I think it very much affected his mental state. Um, you know, and I, th I think he might be an example of a fighter who like maybe took a little bit more damage than he needed to. And it, it, uh, it showed in and out of the cage, unfortunately. Um, in, in terms of it, him appealing this decision, I will say that there is precedence, uh, with the Nevada State Athletic Commission, um, because they tried this once before with a boxer. I don't remember who it was. Um, but it's already been established. They, they actually can't do what they did today. You can't now they can refuse to license a fighter. Which is in effect the same thing, but you they cannot and they're not allowed to institute a lifetime ban. Um, that being said, everything that ha has happened with Vanderlei over the last year or so, and especially like everything he was complaining about himself personally, like in that video, uh, he brought on himself absolutely one hundred percent. Whether it's the uh, PED use, uh, running away from the test. Um, which if he if he had even met with them and refused to take it on site, that at least would have been entered into litigation and the penalty probably would have been less severe because guys have refused to take the test before. Um, and, you know, just all the stuff and like all the wacky behavior. Um, I didn't see the uh, the ultimate fight of Brazil, but, you know, I, I did interact with um, a, a guy I know on Twitter who's an MMA journalist who watched it and said, yeah, Vanderlei was coming off as really, really bad, and, and he would have had people in Brazil booing him, which, if you know anything about the culture in Brazil, uh, and especially the history of them with Chael Sonnen, is incredible. <laughs> 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 that, like, Chael Sonnen would go in there and be cheered. Um, I don't even know what to give that, like, a pro wrestling equivalent to. It'd be like if Sergeant Slaughter and his, like, Saddam Hussein uh, gimmick went to like the midwest and got cheered it's just bizarre, <laughs> because Hulk Hogan yeah. looked like such a jerk it would just be so bizarre um but that's what was happening excuse me and and it's all because of uh everything every decision that Vanderlei has made the last few years especially when it comes to you know the the uh the drugs 
I, I will say, though, having said all that, uh, a lot of the stuff he said about the UFC and a lot of the uh, stuff he said about how they treated him and um, is dead on and absolutely 100% correct. He is not wrong that the UFC does not treat its fighters fairly, uh, that they're the first ones to throw them under the bus. Um, I think even like promoting uh, pretty much the demise of Vanderlei's career coming up on Fight Pass, you know what I mean? Like the way that they promoted this hearing um, was an example of that. Unfortunately, I think it gets skewed because of the messenger, uh, which is a shame because it, it's something that, you know, I, I wish somebody uh, with a better standing in MMA uh, would have come out and said these things first and, and had that sort of a stage to do I it. Mean, I mean, Ben Askren did it, but he just, he's not at that level yeah. of fame of a Vanderlei Silva. Like, I think Ben Askren's a very yeah. smart guy, he, very honest, he and, and he's... He, straight- and he's not wrong, he's not he's he's dead on about everything he says about Dana. Even, even if it's just, like, there's, there's a part of that where it's just Ben trying to make uh, airtime for Ben and, you know, giving himself, you know, more notoriety because he's very smart like that. On the same token, regardless of what his like and you know his motivations are, absolutely one hundred percent dead on with everything he said about Dana and the UFC and how they treat their fighters. Yeah, and we talked about Daddy B's pay per view business and how it's pretty much non existent these days. UFC. I mean, did you hear about Chris Weidman breaking his hand? Yeah, yeah, I, I read about that today. Uh, Man, I mean, I mean that's gonna be. I mean, I know they have Johnny Hendricks and Robbie Lawler moved to that December show. With Pettis yeah. and Melendez, I still think that they're gonna do like. I, I could be wrong. I think it's only gonna do like 300k <laughs> or so. This been, has been a bad year for pay per view with the UFC, and I get it. You know, this, a lot of, a lot of injuries. Gonna, yeah, a lot of injuries, but it's a lot of oversaturation too. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I guess what are your overall thoughts on, on the state of MMA and really, you know, the standard bears the UFC? Yeah, yeah, pretty much your thoughts and mine align perfectly. I, I think that. Uh, I, I think that it's oversaturation to an extent, so that I think Johnson and Carriasso even you could you could promote you could promote and make a, a big time event. The problem is that you're having guys getting title fights who people have seen maybe in like Facebook prelims. You know what I mean? Yeah, it used to be you know you had fewer events and you had fewer televised events, so that you would watch every single UFC event and you would know all these fighters and you would know these guys well before. Uh, even if you're just a casual fan, you would know these guys well before they got a, a title opportunity at any weight class. I don't care if it's like, you know, uh, lightweight or middleweight or even in this case, uh, you know, fly, uh, what is it, flyweight? Yeah. See, that's the problem. I don't even know. Um, I got to think about it for a second. And now it's like you have so many UFC events that the problem isn't just that these you're having guys fight all the time. You're getting, getting guys that are getting lost in the shuffle because there's simply too many fighters to take uh, to uh, to invest in you know, uh, personally, you also are more apt to skip any show, whether it's televised or pay-per-view. And the more opportunities to give people to not watch, the more they're going to not watch. And so you have guys that, you know, say, oh, I'll skip this one because they have another event next week. And then the next week comes and they miss that one. And then all of a sudden you have a guy who went from being an every every single event viewer to a guy who rarely, if ever, watches the UFC because he always figure he figures he can catch it on the back end or watch the next event because he feels like he's not missing anything. And, and UFC, it's been a long time since they had like what is what truly could be considered and by a long time i mean they haven't had one this year really a can't miss event even before the injuries i mean the injuries are a huge problem too uh i'd have to crunch the numbers again but i actually uh, uh wrote a little bit about this on my personal blog uh about how this year um even before the wide women injury was going to trend to be possibly one of their worst years in terms of like total buys uh in ufc history now, their business overall would probably be up when you take into account, like, international and everything, but it really seems like they've stalled, and in 2012, Dana said that that was the worst year in UFC history, uh, in hindsight, and that was the year that, you know, the John Jones uh, injury happened, or the injury happened, then John Jones wouldn't take an opponent yeah, on short notice. Yeah, was canceled, and, and UFC 178 was canceled this year, yeah, just last yeah, month. Yeah, you had that canceled, and then you had, like, you know, all this shuffling around, um, if he thought 2012 was bad for pay-per-view, and I think that's the context he was speaking in, um, this year was already trending to be worse. And with the absence of Chris Weidman, um, man, 
that's going to be uh, when you look at the year in numbers, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really ugly. And uh, they're trying to make up for it by booking the Robbie Lawler uh, Hendricks rematch. They're pushing that up a couple months and doing that in December now instead of February. I I don't know if that can draw. I I know that we as MMA hardcore fans are very excited about it. I don't know if the casual viewer cares that these two guys are fighting. I think they are both guys that, you know, casual viewers would watch on an undercard and be really impressed with and think that's a really fun fight. I don't know if either of them is a top level draw. Certainly not at the level of like they're not going to make up what they lost when Weidman had to withdraw from that fight. Def- definitely not. And I feel like, too, it's getting to the point now, where, and I respect Dana a lot and his contributions, everything he's done, but I feel like a lot of what made Dana so great in years past is working against him and the UFC's image yeah. now. Him saying, oh, Absolutely. if you don't, don't want to watch his pay-per-view, don't buy it. Oh, this card was fun. Why don't you you yeah. see this card was fun? It's like we don't buy cards that are fun. We buy cards yeah. That, that that have intriguing fights that make us want to see it. You know what I mean? Like I don't buy yeah. like a DDB card. I mean, in the old days, I wouldn't buy a DDB card j- just for fun. You know what I mean? But if it's like right. Brock Lesnar versus John Cena, it's unpredictable. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna buy it. Same thing with like you know back in the day, Brock Lesnar, Frank Mir, or even like a Ronda Rousey fight. There's some intrigue. But if it's you know yeah. T.J. Dillashaw versus Fighter Number Forty Five, I don't care how fun it is. I'm not spending yeah. my money on that. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's fun, but who gives a shit? You know what I mean? There's enough free it's, MMA out there. I, I can do anything. Also, too, like not just MMA. I can do anything else that's more fun than just a fun UFC card that has nobody I care about on it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, and especially too, like I know it's been said before, but Dana saying like, uh, you know, well, you're not a real fight fan. If blah blah blah, it's like eventually you're gonna he's gonna get guys saying, yeah, I guess you're right. I'm not a real fight fan, and then just. Pfft. Yeah, the problem is that Dana uh, doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. I think it served the UFC better when, you know, they had this bombastic firebrand as their public face and they were still struggling for respect and name recognition and they didn't have a microscope on them. Now that everybody knows what the UFC is and and Dana's got a lot more microphones in front of them and more time for him to dig himself a hole, um, it's hurting the UFC. I think that the only way that... Uh, They're going to be able to move forward, unfortunately, is if he steps aside. And I know there's a lot of sycophants out there, uh, you know, uh, self-professed MMA journalists and bloggers that that hate to hear that. And, you know, they'll argue that, oh, well, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Look what he's done for the sport. It's like, yeah, done. Past tense. Like, what has he done for the sport in the last few years that the sport hasn't done for itself? And Dana White's not the only guy there. You know what I mean? If you think Dana White is the only guy that makes a difference at the UFC management, you know, you, you probably got another thing coming. I can't say specifically who it is because I don't know, but, you know, it's, it's got a whole team behind it. And, you know, they have to start treating it like that. And Dana being the only public face of the UFC and the only guy who's standing there at press conferences saying, fuck this and fuck that and blah, 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 that shit's not going to fly anymore. You know what I mean? Like, you're supposed to be at the level of the NFL, of Major League Baseball. Or at least act Ma- like you're at the level. That's, I was just going to say that, yeah. And even, like, and by what I meant by that is, yeah, like, you have to, you know, and this is true whether you're uh, working in the entertainment industry, whether you're a writer or journalist, blah, blah, blah. Like, so much of that is just acting like you've been there before. And you have to you have to put forward, it's just like, you know, saying fuck you to uh, journalists and chastising them for not being a promotional arm of your organization is not going to fly. Like, can you imagine if Roger Goodell came and s- came out and was like, you know, fuck you to all these reporters <laughs> who are reporting on the Ray Rice scandal? Like, we laugh because that would be ridiculous. But that is what Dana White does day in and day out. Like, him taking, like, Jonathan Snowden to task for telling people not to buy the pay-per-view or to save their money – and, like, you know, chastising him and, and saying Dave it's irresponsible. And Dave Meltzer using the hype for UFC 177, the hype time on FS1, to bury Dave Meltzer when he didn't even read the article properly. Yeah, for, for something that Dave didn't even say. Yeah, and for, like, you know, it, it was a game of telephone. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Uh, that, that just blew my mind. It's just like, you know how many people watching this, first off, are not even going to know who Dave is? <laughs> I mean, they should, but they're not going to know who Dave is. So they're, like... If you're not, like, confounded by this <laughs> anecdote, you're outraged by it. There was just, like, no way that was going to look good. Um, and it didn't help to sell that pay-per-view. Um, I don't know if the buy rates, the, the buys have come out for that. Did they yet? I haven't seen it yet, no. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be really, really bad. And uh, part of that is not the UFC's fault, because part of that, again, is like the injuries and circumstances and bad luck. Um, but a big part of that is just in their uh, decision-making and how they promote and present their product. Um, even if you just like... Even if you are talking over saturation, I, I think there's too much reliance on the uh, top end of the card in pay-per-views and not building a strong card top to bottom. And, you know, I know Fox Sports 1 and Fox uh, wants those ratings, and I know they help, but a lot of those shows, uh, you could put, you know anybody on and people are going to watch them you're probably going to get the same number those pay-per-views you know you can't just load the main event and the semi-main and just hope everything else falls into place like you gotta if you want to provide entertaining cards you got to load them top to bottom with intriguing and interesting fights and you got to promote towards them uh you know uh hunter took a lot of heat when i was there because he said in an interview that he doesn't watch ufc's because they aren't very good at telling stories and people ripped him for it he's like look at this guy he thinks everything's at work blah 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 I think what he was trying to say, and he's right, is that they don't promote well. They don't give you the opportunity to get to know these guys that are going to be or are contenders. So you're not invested in any title fights whatsoever. The only reason you're invested by uh, about and you're intrigued by it is if you have, if you are a hardcore fan, you have this like familiarity with them, and you know it's going to be a good and interesting fight. But it's not happening at pressers, and it's not happening through TV. There's, like, nothing and no incentive to get people to care for this thing. And I think that's what he was getting at, and he wasn't wrong. And, like, people kind of, you know, they, they, missed, a, uh, they missed the message when he said that. He's, he was absolutely right, and it's, it's a very real problem for the UFC going forward. Yeah, I mean, we can only hope everything gets better, you know, in, two, in 2015 for him. But, uh, you know, there's still going to be a ton of I shows, mean, it's got, it, and there's still It's, it's got to be. Yeah. yeah, it's got to be. I mean, if only... We're going to be getting Ronda and Cyborg. We're going to be getting that John Jones fight finally. Uh, Jones and Cormier. Um, un unless those fights get delayed again, uh, 2015 will already start off strong. It's just, I just hope they look at what's happened last year and think it's not um, an abnormality because already we've had this happen in 2012 and 2015. And it's like, there's one thing to say bad luck on circumstances. Um, but when there's a pattern, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you have a strong year followed by a really shitty year. Um, that's telling you that something's amiss and there's something wrong. And especially, too, when you look on the horizon, like Jones is not drawing as well as he should. Um, Ronda Rousey uh, doesn't really have strong opponents lined up other than Cyborg and well, maybe also, Gina Carano. Well, they also keep her opponents anonymous. I mean, did anybody know who the hell Alexis Davis was before that fight? No, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly, and that's part of the problem, too. And it's just like, you know, you think there's not enough depth in women's MMA. It is there. Um, It's just that, you know, you, you take these steps to just focus on Ronda and not develop the division. Part of that is because Dana didn't have any respect for women going in. Uh, he didn't think that they were draw. He was wrong. And now I think he's still convinced that only Ronda can draw. Uh, and he's wrong. But he doesn't give the other female fighters the opportunity to do it. And I mean, you can say, you know, with Tough 20, he's doing it with a 115-pound division. Um, but one, I think the fact that he skipped one to 25 speaks volumes. And I, I think Tough is a, uh, it, it's a... It's a limping franchise. You know, and it, the, the numbers... The show, I, personally, I've seen the first two episodes. I thought it's, uh, especially the first, uh, the season premiere, uh, the two-hour one, was fantastic, and it was great. Uh, I think it was a mistake to make a two-hour one. I don't think the casual viewer will sit through two hours of this. Um, the other problem, it, you know, it drew, like, record low, I think, for season premieres. You know, the other problem is that, you know, it didn't have... It didn't have any intrigue to it because, you know, nobody cares about Tough anymore. Um, people have already seen the women on there. Um, even though you're saying now it's all women and they're fighting for a championship, but it's a championship for a division that people don't know about. Um, and it's a real goddamn shame because you watch all these women and all these women are stars in their own way. Like Joanne Colorado. Ca Calderwood. How, how do you ever say Calderwood? Calderwood. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Calderwood. Um, so marketable. You know what I mean? She's like so soft spoken and she's got this like eminently likable persona. Um, but then she gets in the cage and she's just a monster. You know, Beck Hyatt has a great look and a great personality for it. Um, you know, Felice Herrig and uh, the the woman that's going to be her initial fight. They're both like great personalities, like top to bottom. Like they're all marketable in some way. 
Um, but instead, all the commercials for it were like, you know, hey, look how sexy they can be, but they can bang in another way. Oh you know, God, that's not yeah. that's not the phrase that they use, but like it pretty, yeah, much, pretty much was much like saying they were, that. <laughs> yeah, it was just like it was so like they were marketing a uh, sex appeal and it was so like condescending and like borderline misogynistic. And it's just like talk about not knowing your audience like that's not going to get anybody to watch this show. Um, but it just shows that like UFC has lost that magic touch when it comes to promotion because they like with this season of the Ultimate Fighter, it's being fucking handed to them, and they can't do anything with it. <sighs> that that is true, my friend. Now we and I were both uh, involved on the digital side of things with Bellator. Yeah, mm-hmm. I helped them launch their app and uh, did did some editorial mm-hmm. work for them. You were the guy that really actually spearheaded. That whole editorial movement at, at Spike you know, with the roundtable picks and everything, which I greatly appreciate because yeah. it got my byline on there. So on air, I want to I want to thank you for that. That's that a great <laughs> I opportunity. I didn't even realize I'm, you're right. I just didn't realize that until you said it. Yeah, that was a, that was <laughs> so, a great opportunity yeah. you, you afford, afforded myself. Yeah, Bell- Brian, Brian, it was, a lot of it was Brian too. Well, I Brian, mean, Ger- let's shout out to Brian Germany, the one of the unsung yeah. heroes of Spike TV. He's a Spike TV producer. Actually, he texted yeah. me right before this show. I'm not, yeah. I kid you not. I'm going to read you the exact text he sent me. And if you guys don't know Brian Dermody, follow him on Twitter. He's a great guy. He's an unapologetic mark for EC3 and Rockstar Spud. I can't blame him. And, he's, and he said, ask Kevin the following. Would you say mm-hmm. Spike TV producer Brian Dermody is more of an overlooked genius or a titan of professional excellence? <sighs> I know, it's a tough one. Yeah, yeah God. Um... I, I think he is, uh, you know, the the safe answer is that he's both. But I mean, I think he's more of a titan than he is overlooked. Yes. Uh, I, I, so I'm gonna go with a titan of professional excellence. Here. Very good. Very good. Hey, w- hey, Brian, we remember this titan. Now Bellator. Yeah. When mm-hmm. we were there, it was the Bjorn show. It was the tournament format. Tensions <laughs> were. Uh, uh, at least when I started, because I, I I started actually to think before you at Spike, because I worked at MMA Uncensored Live when we were still yeah. booking UFC guests, and it was it was a very very unique deal. We were booking UFC yeah, guests, very, guests back. It was a day. weird it was a weird time, wasn't it? It felt you know what it felt you know what <laughs> yeah. it felt like honestly like obviously a much more like uh, downsized version of it, but it kind of felt like the early stages of the Monday Night War. Like that's the closest thing a kid that grew up on the Monday Night War, you know, got. You know, present day, at least for me, also being an MMA fan with Bellator. <laughs> it was the Monday. It was the Monday Night War. If the Monday, if uh, instead of uh, WCW, WWF was fighting Global Wrestling Federation. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It was unique to say the least. At yeah. its peak. At its peak. Yeah, I mean, be, I mean, Bellator was not at that level. Now they moved to Spike, and yeah, I think yeah, 2013. They moved to Spike in 2013. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of really good shows, building up a pay per view, but it, f- it really felt like. I guess at the end of 2013 or close to the end, mid-2013, close to the end, that crap really started hitting the fan. You know, Bjorn had this yeah. problems with Eddie Alvarez. That was very public. That other killed pe- him. Yeah, other people yeah. spoke out, uh, you know, about Bjorn and the tournament format. And with all due respect to Bjorn, I mean, he always gave me his time of day. You know, was mm-hmm. a really nice guy with me. But, you know, there, there were people that did have their differences with them. Enter Scott Coker, who's only been on the yeah. job for, I guess, a couple months now. Maybe not even a couple months, really. Yeah. And thus far, Bellator seems to have a fresh coat of paint. It's see, it just already something way better. different. Something <laughs> different about it. It's just, yeah. I, I don't know. And and I feel bad for Bjorn to some extent because a lot of the shows when when they went to you know into the crapper weren't all his fault. I mean, there were nut shots from Eric Prindle and Tiago Santos, and yeah. I remember Marcin Held was allowed in the casino being under twenty one despite headlining the freaking event in the casino. I mean, there was I, I don't know. I, I guess Bellator was kind of cursed. Under Bjorn, at least in recent years, and you got Scott yeah, Coker it, here now, and it's just they're on a stretch of having some really good shows, and believe it or not, some momentum. Yeah, you know what though, it, it just goes to show like how much things change immediately when Scott took over. Much more watchable though, and fun those events became. Um, Stefan Bonner and Tito Ortiz aside, that was embarrassing, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it's it just goes to show that you know you can you can talk about bad luck all you want. Uh, but when you're when you have a guy like Bjorn, um, who who won't stray from the tournament format, uh, and when he does, it's complete bullshit. Um, and, and all the stuff with Eddie Alvarez, I mean, that's all Bjorn to a T. And that was his personality, and that was his management style, and uh, it did him in in the long run. Uh, I think what he did to Eddie Alvarez was wrong. 
uh, from a professional and from a moral standpoint. Uh, it was nothing but sour grapes, and all it did was hurt Bellator because it ended up with that deal where Eddie fought Chandler one more time, and if he won, he got to leave. Like, just, like, it made absolutely no sense. Like, why would you fight to keep this guy who, like, if they had let go of Eddie Alvarez um, at that time and hadn't, and Bjorn, and to say, let's just say, hypothetically, Bjorn wasn't in charge. It was Scott Coker, and Eddie Alvarez wanted to leave, and, and, and Coker left him on his way. He would have had a guy, Eddie Alvarez, who went to the UFC, and if Eddie wasn't successful in the UFC, it would just go to show that Bellator has a superior fight on Michael Chandler. If Eddie was successful in the UFC and and got a lightweight title shot and, you know, God forbid, became lightweight champion, Bellator had the guy who beat him. Like, either way, it was a win-win situation. But no, like, because Bourne had to have Bellator be his own personality 24-7, which, you know, in some cases that can be, you know, sell success for a promotion when you have somebody that's headstrong. Um, but it really hurt them in this case. You know, that thing dragged on forever. Uh, it made Bellator look bad, uh, and then it just gave Ed, uh, Eddie Alvarez an opportunity to beat Michael Chandler and and then go to the UFC and and prob and go on to better things. And it just made Bellator look bush league. But then it's like you know Coker takes over, and then all of a sudden it's like a lot of you know there's always going to be some bullshitty stuff, but it's good bullshitty stuff. It's entertaining bullshitty stuff. You know what I mean? It's the kind of bullshitty stuff you accept if you're willing to uh, acknowledge that you know uh, combat sports isn't a, a purely athletic endeavor. There's a lot of promotional stuff going on. There's a lot of storytelling going on. Uh, and there always has been going back to the golden age of boxing. It's always been that case. There's always been a story to tell. Uh, and I think Scott Coker gets that, you know, maybe they need somebody a little more charismatic um, doing their, uh, being the public face of the company. Cause Scott's a really, really cool guy and he's a smart guy. Uh, and I think he's great. And I'm a huge fan of his and I always have been. Um, but him as like sometimes you know presenting and announcing fights he doesn't have that bombastic personality that sometimes you need for that sort of thing um so he's not bo so he's not bombastic bart he's more of a bodacious bob he's a bodacious bob he's no <laughs> let me put it this way he's no kevin marshall which um i'm i'm for hire if bellator wants to bring me on to announce fights <laughs> no I'm, I'm kidding partially um but Hire yeah him. like i I think Scott's. I think Scott Coker has already been been great for a Bellator, and uh, I think it's great too because I think he'll provide a legitimate um, alternative to the UFC. Um, and I think that like you'll still see them try to like you know give a little f use to the UFC here and there, even though I think showing replays of old Eddie Alvarez fights is weird. I think yeah. there's better things you could do, um, but. I don't know if that was a Bellator decision or a Spike decision, even though that's they're under one umbrella of Viacom. But, you know, as well as I do from working at Viacom, that a lot of times the left hand doesn't not only doesn't know what the right's doing, but doesn't know how many fingers are on the right hand. <laughs> a, lot of, <laughs> so, a lot of cooks like, in that kitchen. Yeah, a lot of cooks in that kitchen. So I don't know whose call that was, but uh, I, I think they're going to provide a really viable and entertaining alternative to the UFC and an alternative in the truest sense of like not just being a fight promotion and apart from the UFC that's going to try to compete with them, but something, somebody that's going to provide something different from the UFC. Yeah, man. And look, first off, I really do appreciate all the time you've given us, given us here. Before we let you plug everything you're doing, where you're online, I got to ask you, <laughs> what is the story behind the road dog, Jesse James, <laughs> getting on the mic <laughs> And saying, as Kevin Marshall would say, here's the deal. Shouting you out on Monday Night Raw, worldwide television. <laughs> What's the story behind that? And what was that like being backstage and hearing this dude just shout you out? I mean, this is freaking, not only is this the road dog, one of the top stars yeah. of the Attitude Era, but a guy who also comes from the legendary <laughs> Armstrong family. Oh, I'm a huge fan of the Armstrongs, and I always have been. Um, all of them. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, shout out to Road Dog. Road Dog was always great to me uh, during my time there. He, you won't meet a, you, you, you won't meet very many people with a bigger heart than the Road Dog. And uh, he was, he was very. Uh, it, it was, it was really educational just being in the room and talking with him. But he really took the time to like, you know, help us along with the, uh, with you know our storytelling and how we presented it and like you know how it fit into the world of professional wrestling. I'll always be indebted to him in that way. Uh, that night was weird. Again, I was on the home team, so like I was on the road very, very seldom. Uh, you know, only a handful of times was I at Raw and SmackDowns. I was at a few pay per views, um, and I was at events when like they were semi local. Uh, whenever they were in like the New York area, um, 
Yeah, I was at home watching Raw because it was part of my job, unfortunately, which made for long, long days on Mondays and parts of Tuesdays. I can't even imagine what it was like for the guys that were on the road. Um, so I was watching Raw when that happened, and I thought I heard it, but I was like, it was like one of those things where it's like, you know that moment when you lock your uh, keys in your car and you realize the keys are in there as the door is shutting and like you can't stop yourself. You're like, wait, wait, that's happening. But you're like, you can't process yeah. it. It was that. And it was just like it happened and I was just like, yeah, I said my name on TV and then all of a sudden I was like, wait, did it? And all of a sudden I started getting texts from people <laughs> and started seeing mentions on Twitter. Uh, most of which, you know, some of which came at me directly. The rest were like uh, coming through like a, a search bar that I created uh, for Kevin Marshall after it happened. And I was, was like, who the hell is Kevin Marshall? And it was just um, he needed something to rhyme with steel or cage. And uh, I had a little I, I was given a catchphrase called here's the deal uh, just based on a total non story that went on there. Like they always like had people uh, get little catchphrases and little like personality stuff like on on really like just strange uh circumstances mine became here's the deal and uh so he just said it on tv and he just said it just because he's cool um so yeah that was a that was a really weird and funny experience um but i i don't really care about that to be honest um i care more about the fact that i got to work for the road dog that was what was fucking cool man and just because he was a great prof- and not because he's the road dog but just because he was an awesome professional and a great guy and uh bell to bell one of the best heel workers of all time even though he will never admit that himself and uh, a guy who has a really really smart head for the business so uh yeah shout out to him man he was the greatest yeah and, and a tremendous redemption story too i mean you think where that guy was at 10 years ago and yeah where he's at now i mean god bless him he's doing a hell of a lot better yeah, I, I don't know if he'd ever give himself that credit, but holy shit. Yeah, he, he deserves all of it in the world from the, somebody else who went through that partially. You know what I mean? Of like somebody else who's like in recovery. Uh, it was really like it, it was that was the other thing that was great because he talked about it so openly in the room. And that's kind of how we bonded because I was like, oh, shit. OK, cool. There's somebody else who gets where I'm coming from because I didn't share that with other people there because it was just like a very uh, frat boyish environment where you didn't want to show any weakness at any time. Uh, so for, you know, to be able to, you know, have somebody else that knew that you were going through, you know, it was a really cool thing. Uh, and yeah, he, he deserves all the credit in the world for everything he's done, man. Road dog is the coolest cat, coolest cat on the block, he's coolest a, cat in the alley. Yeah, man. He is the, well, he's a dog. He's not, he's still technically the coolest dog in the alley. Oh no, man. He's the coolest cat. The coolest cat is the road dog. That's the irony <laughs> of it. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Quick rapid fire questions. Sure. Day after WrestleMania 31, who's the WWE champion? Um, again, I don't know anything, so like you know, it's just your prediction. Uh, just your prediction, stuff. just from like watching what you've gathered. I mean, God, before what happened, it would have said Roman. Uh, I'm gonna stick with Roman, but it, it, for me, it's not as certain as it once was. I think Roman was very clearly the guy. Uh. But God knows if, like, that would have happened. You know what I mean? It's still, like, up in the air. But, like, with this injury and stuff, I don't know. It might make his. It might make the case for him stronger because he can come back, like, you know, spear to 76 at or after the Royal Rumble, depending on how long his recovery takes. Maybe he's a bigger star for it. Um, but, man, yeah, I don't know. But it won't be. Will it be John Cena? <laughs> Any chance? <laughs> I don't think so. Unless a story pops up that you can tell that makes that intriguing. Uh, like, I, I don't see, like, if maybe Bray had been, a, you know, had been handled a little bit differently and became a bigger star and you could have built to Cena and Bray at this year's WrestleMania, you could tell that story and, and like, do something similar to what we did in the build to 30. Uh, but I, I just don't see it. All right. I, I just don't. I just don't know what. I don't. I don't know who he would win it from, where it would matter or mean anything. It'd be worth it to do it. All right. Okay. Is Billy Gunn Dolph Ziggler's dad? Uh. Probably. Um. But it's gonna take an episode of Mori to prove it. Okay. Did you get a chance to watch a lot of NXT when in your time in WWE? I. Uh, yeah. I mean, as much as I was before. Uh. You know, I watch it on online and then like on the network and stuff. 
it's very watchable. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a closest thing we have to a territory show in these days where it's very simple and straightforward. Um, I also think that works to its detriment. Uh, and a lot of people will talk about that, but it's, 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 it's not a show that's very complicated or, or very hard to write, which is good. Uh, cause a lot of times the pro wrestling, the simpler, the better. Uh, I also think it has a very niche audience that, uh, it can't grow from, from, and maybe that's a good thing since it's a developmental territory. Um, but I think you can sometimes handicap guys when you have, you have guys like Bo Dallas, I think is a perfect example um, a character that really uh, worked well in NXT with a very niche audience and then came up to WWE and just hasn't worked out. And you can talk about how, you know, there are th- things that could have been done differently to make him work, and I'll agree to that extent. Uh, but the bottom line is that character is going to have an uphill battle. And unfortunately, I don't think it really prepared him for it. And I think that's uh, part of the problem with NXT. The only... Pr- the I'm not going to say part of the problem because I think the only problem with NXT because otherwise things are great. Those guys learn to work the WWE style and it's awesome. I think the only problem with NXT is it doesn't prepare these guys with these characters that develop for the uh, for the realities of what happens when you try to bring that character up to the time, so to speak. Uh, so I, I think not not telling doing a more WWE style product in NXT is to the detriment of those guys that are working there. Uh, and that's the only criticism I would level at. Otherwise, those guys, like, top to bottom, went behind the scenes and everything, they did an awesome job. And uh, they deserve all the credit in the world. Any top prospect there you see headlining WrestleMania in a few years? <sighs> I mean, Sami Zayn, um, Adrian I, Neville, any of those guys? Let me say, I, I think there's uh, Adrian Neville now. Uh, he's he's in, uh, He just doesn't have the look, I don't think, for a top guy. Um, unfortunately, he's just... God, if you were ever to put a mask on somebody, I, I, I hate to say that, but it's, uh, you're not Adrian the only Nev- person that's, that's told me that that's uh, it's been in the business. So don't don't feel too bad. I think he's awesome. Like, you know, I had somebody once say to me like, oh, wow, when he hits that uh, red arrow splash, you know, on TV, he's going to become an instant star. It's like uh, people have done more amazing things on I mean, TV. Billy Kidman did the shooting star press once. Yeah, yeah it's like it's part of the problem with like uh, uh, the indie scene now is you have all these guys that look and act the same and they all hit the same moves. It's like, do you know how many guys can hit 450s? I'm like, look, I'm not taking anything away from him. It's impressive. He's an awesome. Adrian Neville's an awesome worker and a great hand. Uh, and I think there's that value in him. Not as a top guy, though, because it's just like he's not he's going to or I, I won't say never, you know, because he can never say never. Uh, but he's got a lot to overcome. Uh, I think in this current era of WWE, I think there's a lot of guys there that could be top stars that won't be just because they're going to be seen as another Daniel Bryan or like too small of a guy. But can they afford? Uh, to, can they afford to really? Uh, I, I guess it, do, be it doesn't matter. Kicking and screaming because you look at what yeah. happened with Daniel Bryan. I mean, they kicked and screamed before they finally pushed him. But I feel like in the era of the network now, yeah. where they needed to get like fan interest and John Cena, you know, winding down. I mean, whether he whether people admit it or not, he's winding down. I mean, he's he's beat up. I mean, I mean, can they really afford to do that at this point? I mean, I don't know. You, you, you can't afford to if if you're if you're uh, for, if you're more forward thinking and have your finger on the pulse of contemporary culture and and uh, look at pro wrestling as not just for what it is but what it can be. Uh, unfortunately, that's just not the reality of the situation. Uh, I'm just looking at this from a pragmatic standpoint based on the uh, the atmosphere that exists there. Uh, and the attitudes that are uh, the attitude that the guy on top holds, and it's just like you know, and, and until that moves on, I, I think Hunter Hunter uh, things are going to be way much much different. But until that happens, you know, like I already heard rumblings of like, oh well, Sami Zayn, they already have Daniel Bryan. But it's like here's the thing with Daniel Bryan is he won at WrestleMania, but it's like, you know, it, it sucks what happened with the injury. But looked at like how they were already like you know positioning. Pain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Kane it's lost like, in three minutes to the Shield. All of a sudden, he's challenging for a title. I mean, God bless Kane, but I mean, oh, Kane, I love Kane yeah. to death. But um, yeah, it's just uh, that's that that's exactly what it is, you know. And it's it's only because the fan that turned against what you wanted to to provide uh, that that you made the change. You know what I mean? It's not. Uh, this groundswell support for Daniel Bryan. They were kicking and screaming, but even then, they only gave you part of it. You know what I mean? It was almost like they they gave it to you half seas. Like, they didn't go full bore with it. Right. Uh, and so it's like, you know, Daniel Bryan will still, I think, in my mind, is the biggest star WWE uh, has. Um, but not to take anything away from John Cena, I think 
the all the hate for John Cena is mostly unfounded. Um, I get that people think he's for babies and he's for little kids or whatever. Um, but man, when he's not on TV and he's not on tour, like, you know, we, you see the difference. He's very legitimately a moneymaker uh, and he deserves it because he's one of the best workers of his generation, whether people want to admit that or not. I agree. Um, yeah, the people, anybody, let me put it this way. Anybody who thinks John Cena is not one of the best workers of all time doesn't know what the hell they're talking about um, and, and has a different idea of working than what it is. And I learned this from working with guys like Road Dogs. It's not what you do. It's when you do it and why. Like, those are the important things. Like, Bruiser Brody is a perfect example. Bruiser Brody was awesome, and his matches are still great to watch. And he had some of the greatest matches of all times. And a lot of times, all that dude did was punch and kick. But it's, like, so much more than, like, what moves he hit. You know what I mean? It's, like, so much more than, like, doing, like, a 450 or a moonsault or whatever. It's just, like, there's so much more to it than that. And John Cena gets that. Uh, Daniel Bryan also gets that too, though. It's like, it's not what Daniel Bryan does. It's how and when he does it. Uh, and he's, he's great. And I think he's probably like the most popular wrestler, uh, even though, you know, his, and his absence is felt. Uh, I just don't see WWE under Vince McMahon ever moving to that era where the top guys are guys like Daniel Bryan. Unfortunately. Well, at least he'll still be a top guy. I I think it sucks. Yeah. 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 Hey, it, 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 it is what it is. Okay, yeah. la- last two questions. These are going to be the most growing. Rap- rapid fire. Did Virgil ever try to sell you anything at a New York subway? <laughs> no. I wish. <laughs> I wish. The, the, the most hilarious and also saddest Tumblr I ever saw was that... Uh, lonely Virgil. There's Tumblr at the... Yeah, Lonely Virgil. <laughs> oh, man. I thought I did actually see him one time. I was taking the transfer on the L. There was a guy that was selling videotapes. Um, uh, on 14th Street, I was taking the transfer from the L to the F, and I, I thought like from a distance it was him because I, I had his back to me. Uh, then he turned around; and it wasn't him. Uh, I was so disappointed. I still haven't seen him in person doing it. All right, and, and lastly, most importantly, have you ever doubted L Dandy? I would never, in a million years, doubt L Dandy, and neither should you. Uh, L Dandy, by the way, uh, for guys who know Lucha, I've heard is a legitimate candidate for the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. I, I, I mean, he was a huge star in Lucha, so. Yeah. I, and, and, and you saw CMLL over the weekend, right? I mean, I saw your tweets. You said that restored your faith in professional it, wrestling. It, it, it restored it. Let me just say this. It, it reminded me why I love professional wrestling so much at that level. Um, and it was it was really cathartic for me to watch it because, you know, it's – it, you know, I understood why they did what they did when they laid off pretty much the entire home team and uh, all of WWE Magazine and, like, you know, the other guys that they let go. Um, funny story, I actually tried to email uh, my contact person at HR question after I got laid off, only to find out she was laid off, too. I <laughs> um, yeah. understand why it was necessary. You know, that's it is what it is. And, you know, I, I didn't harbor any ill will towards them. Um, but it did make it very hard uh to muster the energy and the enthusiasm to watch like pro wrestling in general as a product uh watching that reminded me of all the reasons why professional wrestling uh can would be and is a great form of entertainment uh that was that mask versus match mask match uh for people that don't know ultimo guerrero and uh atlantis uh, it was it was a great match. It had an awesome story, tremendous build. The atmosphere for it was incredible. And when it ended, like you know, uh, before Ultimo Guerrero even took off his mask, there were people in the audience. They showed Ultimo Guerrero's family in tears. There were like grown men, like you know, who were in their fifties and sixties that were sobbing over it. It was just such an amazing moment, and it gave me chills. And it's like, man. Uh, for some for people like us and by us i mean like fred you and me and the people listening to this that uh are lifelong friends of pro wrestling you know it's always been one of those things where you know if you get it no explanation is necessary if you don't no explanation will do um when it's at its best for us there's nothing better than pro wrestling like when it has those moments there's nothing better than pro wrestling and that is the one thing i would say that like i would I would love another opportunity to be involved in some form or aspect. I don't think I would ever go back to WWE again, um, only because I just don't know if it's worth it. Um, I say that without them offering a hand to me. You know, the, if they ask me again, things could change. I would say yes, probably. Um, but, you know, I would I would love another opportunity to be involved in pro wrestling just because 
it provides moments like that for people. Like, that's amazing, and I think that's something you won't see in any other form of entertainment or anywhere else in the world. And I, I, I have to be realistic. Like, I honestly won't work in pro wrestling again, but if I ever did, that's why. And actually, I'm sorry. i got to ask you one, one more question. I know I've had you here for sure. a while, but since you brought up the Ultimo Guerrero and the, and the emotion, mm-hmm. the night of WrestleMania 30 when Undertaker lost, was, yeah. I mean, were the shockwaves felt through the company? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm still shocked by it. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, like, as soon as this goes off the air, I'm, my mouth's going to go back to the permanent state of, of a gape. <laughs> um, yeah, we were all surprised. That was a very um, tightly guarded uh, finish. And one that not everybody, even creative, was aware of. That was, uh, even at home, uh, watching it, uh, we were shocked. You know, I think, I, personally, I think in the long run, it was the right call. I mean, if you look at uh, how Lesnar was booked after that in the SummerSlam match, uh, which I did watch that match, uh, I think it worked. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think it. I, I think it made Brock Lesnar stronger. Um, you know, you could say conventional thinking would be that you give it to a guy who needs it more. Um, but wow, it really put Brock Lesnar, a guy who you didn't think could go to that next level, up to that next level. Even though the story was more about the Undertaker losing. And just hey, you know, you never know. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Undertaker, you know, at WrestleMania again next year. I wouldn't be surprised if that was his final appearance because the guy's not getting any younger. You know what I mean? And he looks older each time he comes out, and that's just the natural part of the aging process. And he also doesn't take, you know, he's he's never been one to you know go easy in the ring in terms of like you know the bumps he takes. He's one of the hardest working guys ever. Um, I I I I, I don't know if I if I was ever put in that position to make that decision. I don't know if I would be comfortable going with it. I certainly would be gun shy. I, I probably would say no. Undertaker goes over here, even if it's through something screwy, uh, and Lesnar can recover from it. But um, I, I also don't think it was the worst decision in the world. It made that night very memorable. It made that it contributed to what I think in my mind was one of the best WrestleManias in history and one of the best uh, nights in pro wrestling history. Absolutely, and it gave us that meme. Oh my God! For forever, oh, the shocked dude. Undertaker guy. Yeah, I mean that guy is great. Like that, that guy. What what I think people like really uh, miss the boat on is in photoshopping it to look like a bomb had just gone off behind him and put like suit marks because with the, the crooked glasses and everything, it looks like he had been in the midst of an expl- uh, like a cartoonish explosion and didn't know what had happened. Yeah, I was just man. That was an incredible moment. The reactions. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they delayed ringing the bell, or I think they rang the bell, but they waited. They to rang play, the bell, but didn't play, play any music. music, and they let it sink and, like, in. Oh Paul's my God. reaction, uh, Paul Heyman's reaction, oh, which um, I don't know if he didn't know, but he sold it like he didn't know, and that made it even better. Yeah, Paul Heyman's is amazing. He's- Paul Heyman's amazing at everything he does, and I wouldn't be surprised if he knew, and he's just that good at what he does. But it came off to me legitimately. As if he was in shock, and then was like, "Yay!" You know, like. But I think either way, like he 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 helped contribute to that moment. Just in like the look on his face when they showed him on camera, and he was just like, "Oh my god!" Like that. Don't expect that. <laughs> just, just yeah. I mean, I, I agree with yeah. you, man. One of the best nights in professional wrestling history. You know, capped off mm-hmm. by you know the Undertaker streak and. Daniel Bryan winning the title. Sad what happened afterwards, but hey, you know what? It was a great, definitely a, a great, yeah. a great moment in time. Kevin, man, I want to seriously thank you so much for your time. You know, I've known each other for a while now, but it's yeah, a, a bit of pleasure talking to you. You know, hearing about everything you've done in, in this business. A lot of things I learned uh, about you tonight. Before I let you go, man, where can people find the Kevin Marshall? Capitalize the Kevin Marshall online. I guess my primary conduit is uh, Twitter, uh, and you can find everything through there. Twitter.com slash that's Marshall with two L's, which you probably tell you if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it on the bottom of the screen, my name. So it's not the Kevin Marshall on Twitter. It's just Kevin Marshall. It, it is just Kevin Marshall. And with that being said, Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let you, since you've been such a great guest, I'll let you get the last word here. Um, yeah, my last word uh, will be that uh, you should always consume everything critically. Uh, don't be a sycophant for the UFC or WWE. Uh, never take the attitude that uh, you should be grateful for their existence. Um, it, it never hurts to take a critical eye towards things. 
um, whether you're an aspiring uh, MMA journalist um, or just a fan. Uh, don't just accept what they give you. Like, demand better. Uh, and that will extend to all things in life. You should always demand better. Uh, you should never be satisfied with what you have. That would be my advice. Life advice from somebody who's never made it. Hey, hey, man, you, you, you've been pretty successful in this business, man. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Thanks so much I, for your time, Kevin. Much appreciated, man. Thanks, man. They've been some delicious cup of coffees.